Hi. Uh, so I, I couldn't really um, zero in on any particular question. So it's more of a family question that I have about the nature and cultivation of conscience, which was, in a sense, what this story uh, exemplified about Abraham. Why, why do you say that? Why do you think that the story exemplified the development of, con of conscience specific specifically? Well, uh, going back to the zigzag, yeah. right, and the star, how you have to keep... Okay, so that's what you were referring to. Okay. Orienting yourself completely autonomously yeah. on your own terms, right? Yeah. Uh, to, uh, to See, okay, so you, you, you hit on something great there, I think, you know, and this is something, weirdly enough, that I learned most particularly from the Pinocchio movie, which I spent a lot of time studying, is because in, in the Pinocchio movie, Jiminy Cricket is an avatar of Christ, essentially. But it's very strange, eh? Because he's a bug. That's the first thing. That's kind of weird. And because Jiminy Cricket is Southern U.S. slang for Jesus Christ, among other things. But, and, and these things get aggregated in, in, in great mythic dramas like that. And that's a great mythic drama. But, you know, one of the things that really makes Jiminy Cricket different from Christ, apart from the fact that Christ wasn't a cricket, is that cr the, the cricket learns as he progresses. Right? Even though he's the conscience, and so you'd think that he would be the infallible guide. That isn't how the movie makers set it up, and that's so cool, is that he's just as muddle-headed as Pinocchio at the beginning. And he's a bit arrogant and puffed up, too. And so, uh, it took me a long time to think that through. And then I realized that, well, you, you, have, the voice of, you have the voice of culture in you, you have the voice of culture within you. But it's old and dead and out of date, and it's not fully articulated and updated, and then what happens is that if you enter into a dialogue with it and you hammer yourself against the world, then you get hammered into shape and so does your conscience. And so you both become elevated and so, well, so anyways, I think that's, that's ridiculously cool because it means that your conscience, you don't have an infallible guide, but you have something within you that you could build into an infallible guide if you cooperated with it and, and fed it. So. Well, so I, I think that's very interesting. So that being said, uh, yeah, the, the picture that I have in my mind of um, uh, the cultivation of virtue in general, it's kind of like taking a, uh, a block of wood and trying to carve out a sphere out of it. It'll never be perfectly round, but the more you carve, right, the rounder and rounder it'll Right, that's successive approximation. Yeah, well, one of the, it's, it's also like, uh, what do you call that, compound interest. This is one of the things that's also, and I think this puts you on the to those whom more shall be given, part of the curve. It's like, you know, you, you don't have to improve yourself very much each week to really improve yourself a ridiculous amount in a year. You know, so you could make, you could, you could, you could vow to make your day one one hundredth of a percent better than the day before. And that would do the trick. If you were, if you were constant about that, that would do the trick. So that, that's this successive approximation. It's, you, you don't want to underestimate the utility of incremental progress, man. It's really, it's deadly powerful. So, so, so let's say you get to the, um, you know, the, the higher ends of the curve, right? You're like a pretty virtuous person. Um, let's say you even become a sage or something of the sort. And I mean, when should you doubt your conscience? Like, what are things that we should watch out for, even when we... That's great. Well, that's... Yep, okay. Um, uh, just to get it out of the way, right? Yep. Um, I don't know how much this relates. Well, it does relate, but psychopaths, for example, the entire idea that they lack a conscience, and that's why, right, that's what psychopathy is. Um, whether or not you agree with that definition, right? But there's an issue of conscience, again, at play with psychopathy. Um, how can we, the first question, uh, doubt ourselves in a way that's warranted, right? Regardless of how virtuous we've become. Yes. And can you treat a psychopath? Could they cultivate a conscience? Okay, so let, let, we'll start with the first one. Part of the reason that, that I believe that freedom of speech is the canonical right, let's, and obligation, right? More importantly, even, obligation is that that's how you figure out if you're wrong. You know, because, so I sit home and I think and I think and I think, let's say. But I'm like, who am I to think? There's so many things I don't know that it's, it's just, uh, there's, the, what I know compared to what I don't know is so minuscule 
that it's a preposterous act just to say something. Okay, so, so no matter how much I sit at home and think, I'm not going to fix that. I'm going to be full. And then I have biases, but my temperament, and I have biases because of my malevolence, and I have biases because of my, my gender, my sex, let's say, since we're not so fond of that word. Um, <laughs> So, if, uh, no matter how much I sit home and think, I'm still going to be wrong and malevolent. So then what do I have to do is I have to talk to some other people. And I have to say, this is what I think. And it's going to be ugly, you know? Because, what the hell do I know? But then if I listen, people will tell me why I'm wrong. And lots of people have been telling me why I'm wrong. Like a lot, and it's hard, you know? It's hard, but, it's, but I've learned something from it. Like I, I had this revelation, let's say, about being yelled at by your father. Now, I know that you can be yelled at too much by your father, but it's like, you're wrong, man. And so someone's yelling at you, and maybe they're only 10% right. But if you shut the hell up and listen, then you can figure out where you're wrong. And then maybe you can be thankful for that. And then maybe if you shut up and listened, your father would quit yelling at you. You know, because he's wrong too. What the hell does he know? He knows how to yell at you and tell you how you're wrong. And he's throwing things out you, at you that are probably not true. But some of it's true. And you know, if someone can tell you why you're wrong, they've given you a great gift. Because then you don't have to be wrong anymore. And you might think, well, who cares if you're wrong? But... You know, there's a line in the New Testament, too, is if the blind lead the blind, won't they fall, in, won't they fall into a ditch? And the answer to that question, by the way, is yes, they will. And so the reason that you want to think is because thinking is how you, like when you think, you create a, 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 a fictional world that's, that's an analog of the world, and then you make an avatar of yourself to act in that world. And then if the avatar dies, you don't act out those actions, Right? Well, so if you think properly, then you don't have to suffer and die. And so if you can say what you think, and people can tell you why you're wrong, and, you know, to say what you think under extreme circumstances means that you're going to say things that no one wants to hear. Because those are the things you don't know about. Those are the things that are conflictual and difficult. And those are going to be hard conversations, man. And you're going to be wrong about them a lot. If you don't get to stumble forward with your stupidity, then you can't be corrected. And so, so there's no distinction between free speech and thinking, and there's no distinction between thinking and thriving. And so those who want to inhibit free speech do not wish for people to thrive. And I believe that. So, thinking does not happen inside your head. That's only the beginnings of thinking. And it's this that we're doing here that's thinking, you know? So, we have to protect that. Psychopaths. I don't... I say this, I hope, non-naively. Also having dealt with psychopaths in my clinical practice, and I would say now and then in my life. I don't believe in psychopaths. I don't believe that we know enough to say there are people born without conscience. Um, I don't think the psychometric measurement of psychopathy is everything that it should be. I've been trying to model it in the big five domain, I think. Now, it's complicated because, so I would say a psychopath, a classic psychopath, is likely extroverted, especially assertive, disagreeable, and unconscientious, and maybe extremely low in neuroticism, so you can't frighten them. But, so that's a rare combination, because it's extreme on many traits, right? But that, I don't believe that that means that someone with that personality configuration is doomed from birth to a pathological existence. Because there's things about psychopathy that, that, the, that the classifiers, those who claim, like Cleckley, that the psychopath is born in some sense, can't explain. It's like, well, what about the cruelty? There seems to be a motive there. You know, well, they're passionless and they lack, no, they lack emotion. Well, why are they cruel then? For entertainment? Well, but then you have to explain the entertainment motivation. Like, there's a failure in some sense with the classic psychopathy theorist to come to grips with the problem of malevolence. It's skirted over. And you can't do that if you're talking about psychopathy. It's like malevolence is the bloody issue here. And so, 
The other issue with the psychopath is that he's irredeemable, right? That's the idea. I don't think we know enough to make such claims. Now, and that doesn't... I know the psychopathy literature quite well, and I have great respect for the primary researchers in the field. I want to make that perfectly clear. But we're talking at a different... We're talking... We're approaching the problem from a different level of analysis here, something like a spiritual level of analysis. And I don't think that there's an easy, easy translation from the descriptive psychometric, psychiatric approach to the spiritual level. They don't match. And I'm more likely to say, let's not assume the soul is doomed from birth, right? And I'm, I'm loath to think that there are people born irredeemable. Although I do think there are irredeemable people. You know, the, the death penalty issue is interesting in that regard, you know, because I've read a lot about really terrible people. And I've also read a lot about what really terrible people said about themselves. And many of them wished for the death penalty. And so it's absolutely clear that there are things that you can do that deserve the death penalty. But that doesn't mean that the state should have the right to impose it. That's a different question. So... Yeah.